Welcome to your boy, Deluxe Man's WrestleMania review series. We are 20 WrestleManias in. We're talking about WrestleMania 20 today. WrestleMania 20, where it all began again. I will put this note at the beginning of the video because I want people to know, yes, I will be discussing the Chris Benoit tragedy in this video. But only this video. Now, Chris Benoit does have a lot more WrestleMania matches to go before his tragic death in 2007. But I want people to understand me when I say this. I'm tired of talking about it. I don't like talking about it. But for this WrestleMania, I kind of have to. I'm in a position to where if I don't talk about it, it's not going to make much sense. So, I want you to know right now. I will be discussing... The Chris Benoit tragedy at the end of this video because it pertains it pertains to the main event. I will not discuss it at any point for the remainder of these WrestleMania reviews. I'm letting you know now as like a disclaimer of the video. So with that said, WrestleMania 20 overall show, solid. Enjoyable show overall, sat through it. I hit a couple of bumps and a very bad bump. You know what that bad bump was? Goldberg and Brock Lesnar. Jesus, it's just as bad as I remember it. It doesn't get better. I've seen that WrestleMania 20 match. How many times already? Like five? Maybe even more times than that. It's just as bad as the last few times I watched it. It doesn't get better the more you watch it. That's one of the matches that remain bad. It's like watching Taker and Giant Gonzalez. It doesn't matter how much you watch it. It doesn't get better. It's a horrible match. But other than that big dip and a few others that were just so-so and forgettable. Show was solid. We have one classic. One strong classic to end the show. And it kind of makes up for the rest of the crap we deal with. WrestleMania 20 was, oh my god, five hours five hours now why was it five hours basically because the, the brand split we had so many talent coming in we had to even when we had fatal four-way tag matches like we had four teams in one match four corner matches i don't know what we call them four corner tag matches fatal four-way tag matches whatever even when we had those matches this show was long i am not a fan of five hour long wrestlemanias i'm not if it's four hours, okay. That's pushing it. But I can deal with that. I'd rather it be three hours or at least three hours and a half. It doesn't need to go four and a half, five hours. It's a long show. So, so that to me is a dip. Not too much of a dip, but just a minor dip of the show. Uh, let's talk about this thing. So it was in, of course, the home of WrestleMania 1 and WrestleMania 10, Madison Square Garden, New York City, New York. Commentators Jim Ross and Jerry the King Lawler for Raw. For SmackDown, Michael Cole and Taz. Attendance, 18,500. As you guys know, the attendance for these shows for Madison Square Garden aren't that big because the arena doesn't hold that many seats. But they always sell out. They consistently always sell out for Madison Square Garden. Interviewer was Lillian Garcia, and of course the ring announcer was Howard Finkel. We opened up the show with, now, let me just stop for a minute because someone told me in my past WrestleMania reviews that I always say we open up with a national anthem, when sometimes we open up with America the Beautiful. So I guess I should start differentiating which song is opening up the shows to be more thorough. So we open up with America the Beautiful, song by Boar's Choir of Harlem. I don't know who they are, but they were great. Beautiful, beautiful performance. Then we get into our first match involving You Can't See Me, Thugonomics John Cena taking on the United States Champion at the time, The Big Show. Decent match. I remember it being better, but I guess watching it a second time, it wasn't as good as I remember. Uh, this is the first time, the first time we got a glimpse of how powerful John Cena is. He slammed, well, I'm not going to say attitude adjustment, thank God. I'm calling it what it is. It's the FU. But he slammed the Big Show twice with the FU. 
The crowd was hot for it. Great moment for John Cena. I can't hate on it too much. It's not the match I would open the show with. Because you know how I do things. I like opening up a show with a fast-paced match. But the crowd was hot, so I'll let it pass. Next was one of two four-corner tag matches. It's the Raw World Tag Team Championships. It's RBD and Booker T, who are your tag team champions, taking on La Resistance, Garrison Cage, and Mark Jindrak. Some of you just went, who? I understand. And the Dudley Boys. Average match. Nothing special. The SmackDown one wasn't all that special either. Matter of fact, let me just get that one out the way. Let me go all the way down my list. Let me get it. Okay, the SmackDown WWE Tag Team Championships. Too cool. Rikishi and Sky Tuati. Versus the world's greatest tag team, or Team Angle, Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin versus the APA versus the Bastion Brothers. Again, it's just a reason to throw them all in your face because we need to fill up five hours. Or Honestly, it's not even trying to fill up five hours. They had so much talent that they had to go five hours. See, I'd rather, in a predicament where we have to go a long time at WrestleMania, I'd rather we have five hours because we have no choice. We have to fill the card with all these talent. Unlike WrestleMania 33, which has seven hours just for the sake of having seven hours. Well, you don't need seven hours. But the tag matches were average, both of them. So let's reverse. Let's go all the way back up. So after the Raw match, we had, I believe that was Christian and Chris Jericho. Yeah. Christian and Chris Jericho were a tag team before this WrestleMania. And they were involved in a love story. A love angle. Now, I know a lot of you don't like love triangles. I will say... Out of all the love triangles done in wrestling, this one was actually pretty good. A well-told love story with a really, really cool twist. So, Chris Jericho and Christian's feud in 2004 was actually a very underrated feud. They had some really good matches. And this was, if I'm not mistaken, this has to be Christian's biggest win. Up to his point as a single star. You know, as a single star, this was his biggest win. At, at least at WrestleMania. Uh, he held the IC Championship, and I think he also, he held the European Championship, I think he held the Hardcore Championship, and I know he's a multiple-time tag team champion, so he's held championships, but he never had a significant victory until he beat Chris Jericho, who is a former world champion. Now, what people remember most about this match was Trish Stratus turning heel on Chris Jericho. Man, I didn't see that coming. I remember the first time I saw that. And I thought it was awesome. What a heel what a heel turn for Trish Stratus. Because think about this. Christian beat the living hell out of Trish. I think it was like two weeks before this WrestleMania. He beat her up badly. And so we're thinking, oh yeah, she's no way, in no way, shape, or form turning on Chris Jericho. We were wrong. Matter of fact, after she turns on Chris Jericho and Christian hits him with the unprettier, they go upstage. And freaking Christian grabs Trish by her hair, and she smiles like she likes the roughness. And they make out steamy, steamy make-out session. I will admit, though, Trish turning heel was hot. Ridiculously hot, the way she turned heel. And she garnered some major heat around this time, which lasted, I think, a little over a year before she turned back into a babyface. Regardless, I enjoyed her heel run. I thought she had a great heel run. And... She even goes on to have an amazing, amazing feud with Lita later on this year. And they close Raw with a classic. December 2004. I don't remember which I don't remember which Raw it was. I think it was the last Raw that year, maybe. I don't remember. Someone give me a date in the comments. But that was a classic. We do see Trish next year's WrestleMania, I think. Yes, she is wrestling at next year's WrestleMania against Christy Hemme. And I think she's still a heel. Yeah, she's still a heel, and then she gets hurt, and then comes back as a babyface. So, Trish was a great heel. This was a great heel turn. As for Chris Jericho and Christian, they go on to have another match at Backlash, and Chris Jericho gets his win back. And I think that wraps up this whole love triangle business. Evolution! Ric Flair, Batista, and Randy Orton. Great stable. One of my favorite stables. Orton was the legend killer, and he was a boss at this time. Batista wasn't the animal yet. Well, 
I think he was the animal. He wasn't the superstar he was eventually going to become. He was still trying to grow into it. But it was Evolution taking on the Rock and Sock connection. The Rock and Mick Foley. Foley and Randy Orton had one of the greatest rivalries I have ever seen in wrestling, period. I love the story of Mick Foley questioning himself against Orton, leaving the company, taking his ball and going home, Orton spitting in his face, burying his name, and then Mick Foley came back to show he's not a coward, returning at the Royal Rumble. One of the best returns, the best returns in wrestling. And they built into this match, and I gotta say, I remember not liking this match as much the first time. But looking back on it, watching it again, it's a good match. I'm happy. One of the reasons why I'm happy, I got a chance to rewatch the WrestleManias. So many people hate this match. And I don't get it. It's a fun match, man. A lot of energy. Not to mention five of the biggest stars in WWE history. If not wrestling history. I don't recall a slow moment in this match. I love seeing The Rock mock Ric Flair strut. The Rock was awesome. We had two hot tags. And the crowd went ape you know what over it. But I also like the fact that the crowd was behind Ric Flair. Ric Flair was really hard to hate around this time. He's always been hard to hate. That's just Ric Flair. People don't like to boo Ric Flair unless he's in a storyline that calls for it. Orton wins with an RKO on Mick Foley, just as he was going for Mr. Sacco. Now, following this, Backlash 2004, we have the last match in the Randy Orton and Mick Foley uh, feud. Mick Foley, as Cactus Jack took on Randy Orton in a hardcore match, it is by far the best, if not the best, one of the best matches Randy Orton has. Classic hardcore match. Go out of your way to see it. Backlash 2004. Mick Foley or Cactus Jack versus Randy Orton, the legend killer. Awesome. Amazing match. Please, please go watch it if you have not. If you have seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You get these other idiots going, I don't want to see it, I don't want to see it. You make them see it. And you're not idiots for not wanting to see it, but trust me, you would be crazy not to see this match. And that match, basically, <laughs> it basically elevated Randy Orton to the main event because he goes on to SummerSlam 2004 to beat the world champion and walk away into a feud with Triple H where he gets kicked out of Evolution and becomes a babyface. That didn't last very long, but it does build into an amazing match next year's WrestleMania. And as well as Batista, who also has a high-profile match for next year's WrestleMania. So Evolution did some wonders for both Randy Orton and Batista. Let's move on to, oh yeah, Playboy evening gown match. Stacy Keebler and Miss Jackie taking on Tori Wilson and Sable. So, I know it's called the Playboy evening gown match, but... They end up taking off their gowns, and we see them wrestle in bra and panties. It's more WrestleMania softcore porn. Who am I to complain? You can't go wrong there. Look, I know some of you are going, But the legs, man, they're objectifying the women. It's not the greatest thing for women in wrestling or WrestleMania and WWE. Look, the company knew. Fans wanted the puppies. And they gave fans the puppies. A foursome of the puppies. I'm sorry. I'm not going to hate on this match. I'm not going to give it a grade because it's not a match. It's not, but it was, it was quite the entertaining match, that's for sure. We have a WWE Cruiserweight Championship. Cruiserweight Open. It was a bundle of cruiserweights. Chavo Guerrero, Ultimo Dragon, Shannon Moore, Jamie Noble, Funaki, Nunzio, Billy Kidman, Rey Mysterio, Tajiri, and Jimmy Wang Yang, who was Akio at the time. Chavo wins. Decent match. It was a popcorn flick match. It wasn't anything special. At least not worth watching more than once. But if you watched it, you liked it. It wasn't anything crazy. It was better than the next freaking match. Goldberg versus Brock Lesnar won their first encounter. I remember being so hyped for this match. I was excited. I was looking forward to it. There was no way in hell this match should have been this bad. Especially with Stone Cold Steve Austin as the special guest referee. But man, was it horrible. 
The crowd hated this match. They completely took a dump all over these two. You all know the story. Goldberg and Brock Lesnar were leaving, and they put no effort, no effort into this match. Stunk up the joint. Honestly, if Austin was to have stunned both of them and then just ended the match in a no contest, I would have been fine with it. This match was so bad that Mr. I hate no contest at WrestleMania would prefer a no contest. Think about that. This match was that bad that I would have preferred a no contest. It was a disaster. An absolute disaster. Goldberg beats Brock Lesnar. Austin stuns both of them anyways. That was the best part of the match. Austin stunning both of them. Oh, let's move on. We have the women's championship. Well, uh, uh, yeah, it was more of a hair versus hair match, but whatever. The title was on the line. Victoria took on Molly Holly. Average match. The match was fine. It was more known for Victoria beating Molly Holly and Molly Holly getting her head shaved absolutely bald. I am not kidding you. Molly Holly. Molly Holly had her head shaved bald. Clean bald. People don't give Molly a lot of respect. They should. Molly, Molly was awesome, man. I miss Molly Holly. She was one of the few female wrestlers that was actually, one, very attractive, two, really good inside the ring, and three, not a bitch. Really nice person. Now, she's just chilling. She's not even wrestling no more. She's, I don't know what she's doing anymore. I just know she's just living her life, doing what she does. But next up, WWE Championship, or the Undisputed Championship on SmackDown. Eddie Guerrero, your champion, versus Kurt Angle. So Eddie won the championship, beating Brock Lesnar at No Way Out. Amazing title win. Amazing moment for Eddie Guerrero. And this match was also amazing. Top quality matchup between both men, although... <sighs> I can't call it a classic. I would like to call it a classic. I would like to sit here and tell you, come on, two of the best wrestlers to ever exist having a match at WrestleMania. It's a classic. Uh, it just missed it. It was a bit off. I don't know. There was some slow moments in the match. I think if they worked it a little differently, it could have been a classic. Uh, regardless, straight up amazing wrestling match. Love seeing Eddie Guerrero escape the ankle lock by untying his boot and pinning Kernango with a roll up. Great match. Classic Eddie Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero was the person who honestly was working as a heel. I dare say he was able to garner baby face, he, baby face momentum, baby face pops working as a heel. I don't know how he did it, but that's a testament to who Eddie Guerrero was. He was able to make the crowd love him despite cheating. Lie, cheat, and steal, and still be loved. Eddie had that, man. He was the only, one of the only few performers, one of the only few performers who can elicit such a response from the audience. Loved him. Rest in peace, Latino Heat. WrestleMania streak match. Number 12. The Dead Man Returns. Now, uh, the story going into this, American Badass Taker had a feud with Vince McMahon last year, and he lost, basically lost, uh, to Vince thanks to a little help from the big red monster, Kane. He was buried alive. He returned at the, well, he didn't return, return, but he made an appearance in the Royal Rumble through Blackout and a gong, distracting Kane and getting him eliminated. And then, after months of build-up and mind games being done to Kane, mine, mime, did I say mime games? <laughs> mime games. Mind games being done to Kane. Uh, he finally shows up. And here's what I will say. I know a lot of people didn't like how he returned, basically, with the American Badass gimmick. It's basically the American Badass get up with the gimmick of the dead man. And I'll say this. To me, I actually thought it was awesome. I love that he mixed the dead man with the American Badass because it's like he evolved into his ultimate form. And one thing I will say about Taker's run as the American Badass, I loved it simply because it made Taker versify make him, you know, get more versatile inside the ring. His uh, in-ring ability improved because of it. He wasn't doing the whole set-up, stoic, no-selling wrestling matches all the time. I think his matches will get 
better because of it. I think his matches do get better because of it. I think uh, as a performer, it really does help to see him, you know, combine both styles. Uh, as for the match, and I say all that, and I'm getting ready to say that the match was average, because it really wasn't about the quality of the match. It was more about Taker returning as the dead man. And the crowd loved it. They thought it was amazing. So I'll give it that. The match itself was average, but the return, awesome. However, nothing, and I mean nothing, came close to topping the main event. The main event was a triple threat. Raw, WWE World Heavyweight Championship match. Chris Benoit versus HPK Shawn Michaels versus The Game Triple H. My favorite triple threat match in history, and I dare say the greatest, the greatest triple threat match to ever take place at WrestleMania. Some people might argue it's the greatest WrestleMania match. Uh, well, I wouldn't even say the greatest WrestleMania match. I don't think it's that bad. I don't think it's that good. Um, but the greatest triple threat match in wrestling history. That's what I was trying to say. Um, I don't know, man. I just feel like in terms of the performances, the pacing of the match, the entrances, the spectacle of it all, the build-up with Chris Benoit winning the Royal Rumble, starting at number one, going all the way to the end, the only person to do that since Shawn Michaels, uh, the fans getting behind Chris Benoit, booing HBK and Triple H because they want to see him win. So many things just made this a classic, man. My favorite spots were seeing Chris Benoit do a cross face on Shawn Michaels. And just as Shawn Michaels was about to tap out, Triple H jumps in and grabs his head. I love that. That was awesome. I love seeing Shawn Michaels and Triple H put Chris Benoit through a table with a double suplex. You see Triple H and Shawn Michaels both busted open. They both bled like pigs in this match. Uh, of course, the ending with Chris Benoit making Triple H tap out. Amazing stuff, man. Amazing match. Chris Benoit is your new World Heavyweight Champion. Jim Ross, in my opinion, had his one of his best calls. Chris Benoit's 18-year odyssey has culminated at WrestleMania 20. By God, he did it. And Jim Ross was crying. He was crying, man. It was an emotional moment. And seeing Chris Benoit on his knees, tears down his face, the championship being held in front of him, and Eddie Guerrero comes out, these two best friends having a WrestleMania moment together, embracing inside the ring as confetti falls. One of the greatest endings, greatest endings in WrestleMania history. And I hate the fact, I cannot stand the fact that it's all, all being tarnished. It's all been tarnished by the tragedy in 2007. Those of you who don't know what happened, I'm pretty sure you do. Chris Benoit murders his family and kills himself in a double homicide, suicide, 2007. And WWE is going out of their way to erase him from their history. And to me, I get it, I understand it, uh, to protect your image and to avoid so much hell. It had to be done. As a wrestling fan, it bothers me a lot. Because the whole point of being a fan of wrestling, the whole point of wrestling is to essentially put a smile on your face. It's essentially made to elicit emotions from you, to tell a story, to make you happy, to make you feel sad, to create a feeling of triumph and defeat. And to me, if you look at history, Chris Benoit, to me, was one of the best at it. He was one of the greatest storytellers, greatest wrestlers, greatest performers in the sport. And I now have to see all of that be completely destroyed or just taken away because of how he ended his life. And again, I get it. It just, to me, as a performer, it just, it just sucks. You know, we have to, we condemn the art for what the man did and I don't know. I don't like talking about it because there is no there is no way to look good with it. There is no way in any case for me to look good with what I'm saying. I'm going to look like how dare you support a murderer. You know, it's, it's it is what it is, man. I don't know. It it sucks. Uh, however, I will still say regardless of how he ended his life. 
he had one of the best triple threat matches in WrestleMania history. He had one of the greatest wins in WrestleMania history. He had one of the greatest moments celebrated with Eddie Guerrero in WrestleMania history. I will always remember WrestleMania 20 as the night Chris Benoit went from being just an average man to being a legend, to being an icon in the sport of wrestling. It just, it's just one of those things where he will never be seen as an icon. He will never be seen in that light ever again because of how he ended his life. Well, that's it. That's the legacy of WrestleMania 20. The legacy of WrestleMania 20 is a show that had a classic that the company and many others have chosen to pretend it never existed. And it's sad, but that's where we are. Hopefully one day, hopefully one day, we can get past it. Will it happen? I don't know. But I would love one day to see WWE again acknowledge Chris Benoit, uh, at least for this, at least for WrestleMania 20. But give me your thoughts about everything down below. How do you feel about WrestleMania 20? How do you feel about Chris Benoit and the tragedy? Again, I'm not talking about it ever again. I will mention Chris Benoit later on in WrestleMania because I have to. But in terms of the tragedy, not talking about it. But thank you guys for watching. I'll catch you next time at WrestleMania 21. Now, this show, I think it's one, I think it's one of the most underrated WrestleManias of all time. WrestleMania 21. And you'll hear why next time. Your boy, Deluxe Man Shining Golf. And Deluxe Man's World.